different things to make the link level work. So how does so your hardware interface, your NIC card, uh, how does it actually talk to other things on its network? And we'll see. Above that, we have kind of an internet layer, broadly as we're calling this, so we kind of have IP in there. Above that, we have two different transport layers we'll talk about, protocols TCP and UDP. And finally above that, we finally get all the applications that we know and love. So HTTP is web, what's SMTP? Email, right, simple mail transport protocol. Above, and we also have DNS, so what's DNS do? Yeah, domain name, right? So it resolves the name you type in your browser into an actual IP address that you can talk to. Uh, what about NFS? Ooh, a lot less people. Yeah, network file share, right? So this is how you can share uh, files on a network very broadly. Uh, so I'll share a fun fact. When I took networking in undergrad, we had to name the whatever, five or seven layers. I got all of them except for the last one which I can only remember started with a P, so I put the pizza layer. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was not correct, it's the physical layer. Uh, but it was very close, I feel like, I may have got a smiley face, I don't know, it's been a long time. So IP addresses, so every host on the network has an IP address, and for now we're gonna kind of ignore IPv6, because that kind of adds some complications here, we're gonna focus only on IPv4, but a lot of these high-level concepts apply. So, what would be the analogy of the IP address in sending, let's say, a piece of mail in the United States? So when I want to send mail from me to ASU or somewhere else, <coughs> how does it get there? What do I do? What do I have to do? So somebody, has anybody sent a piece of mail in their life? <laughs> you drop it off at like a local postal service, and then yes. But well, what do you drop off? Uh, Let's say a postcard. With information. What kind of information? Uh, uh, address. Address. Two addresses. So, what's one address? So the address would be the, the sent the recipient's address. Is that all you put on there? And the sender's address. The sender's address, right? So the destination address, the sender's address. Why do you put the sender's address on there? Yeah, so in case something goes wrong, they know how to send it back, right? Or maybe that, what if you send it to an address that doesn't exist, right? Because that, that piece of mail doesn't go away. So, similarly to physical addresses, right? The building that we're in, I have no idea what the address is, but I know we have an address, and if you took out your phone, you can find it. Uh, the brickyard where my office is is 699 South Mill Avenue, right? That's the uh, physical address of that. And similarly, every host on the network will have an IP address. And we'll go into more details about what these things mean. Uh, so IPv4 addresses are 32 bits. So how many IP addresses does that give us? Two to the 32, good. It's like four billion something, something, something? No. What is it, around two billion? All right, it's 2 to the 32, right? So we have this many bits. This is how we can address uh, other nodes on the network. And it should be very familiar to you. Hopefully you've seen this decimal dotted notation. So this means we split that 32-bit integer up into the first 8 bits. So the first byte is the first number. So it's going to be anywhere from 0 to 255. The second one's 0 to 255. The, second one's zero to, or the third one's 0 to 255. The fourth one's 0 to 255. So using this, this is kind of a quote, quote, human readable way to represent those 32 bits, rather than just having the straight number, right? You could just take this and turn it into a decimal number, whatever that 32 bit address is, but that would be very hard to understand. Okay, but the other thing that this gives us is these network IP addresses aren't just random, right? You don't just get assigned some random 32 bit number we actually have different classes of network. And this is a little bit of the older style, this class-based routing. Uh, so the idea is depending on the first, in this case it was class A, seven bits, 14 bits, or 21 bits, that would tell you what network to go to, and then the remaining bits would tell you what host within that network. Uh, so this was the original kind of way that IP addresses were done. Your 
network had to be within one of these classes. Unfortunately, the drawback here is here you have either two to the 24 hosts, two to the 16 hosts, or two to the eight hosts. That was all you could get. And so this proved very inflexible because you be a small, you know, some kind of organization, you get two into the 24 hosts, which you can never possibly fill. So you have all this unused IP address space. So then they came up with this classless routing system where instead of every network had to fit exactly in one of these things, um, blah, 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 IPv6. So yeah, so part of the problem here is uh, two to the 32 sounds like a lot of hosts. Right? But once you start splitting them up into chunks of 2 to the 24 or 2 to the 16, right, you lose and you get a lot of waste in there. So, and as all of the number of devices that we have are exploding, right, now we need kind of uh, a more fine-grained way to define classes. And also we are actually eventually going to completely switch protocols to IPv6, which has uh, 128 bits for addresses. So here you have two to the 128-bit addresses that you can use. So uh, the size and number of addresses we can have uh, increases a lot. OK, so CIDR, the important thing here is we can place the network ID and host ID boundary on any bit in between the 13th bit or the 27th bit. So you can have a network that's as small as 32 hosts, so if it's all the way in. Uh, or 27th if it's on the 27th bit, or you can have uh, 524,000 hosts. So this gives networks a lot more fine-grained granularity in how they allocate IP addresses. Okay, so IP, we're gonna look at IP first. So IP is really kind of the glue of the internet. So it provides, these are important things we're gonna unpack, Connectionless, unreliable, best effort datagram delivery service. Right? So this means, so it's IP will try to get whatever you send from your IP address to a destination IP address, but it offers almost zero guarantees. Right? We can see here, it's un, it's connectionless. What does that mean? Right, so we don't connect directly to the IP address that we want to talk to. If you think about, if you have two to the 32 hosts on the network, how could they just all directly talk to each other, right? Uh, so we definitely can't do that. So we're, we don't connect directly to the host that we want to talk to. What about unreliable? <coughs> now we have no guarantee, we have no idea. We just send something, we don't know if it's gonna get there. Best effort means, well, it's going to try really hard, but it's not going to guarantee you that your packet's going to get there. Does this seem like something you want to build an entire, like, multi billion dollar economy on? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why yes? Because it is. Here's your proof. It currently is. So, what, what's the positive of these aspects? What was that? Speed. Speed. Who's saying that? All of your sounds. I can hear the sound from here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it, it can be fast, right? So because it doesn't guarantee us that it's going to get there, maybe it can be faster. What else? Easy to implement. What was that? Easy no overhead. Easy to implement? It could be easy to implement. What was that other one? No overhead, less latency. Less latency? Yeah, so maybe they can get packets out there quicker. <coughs> system, and I'm saying transfer $1,000 from my account to somebody else's account, 
wants to make it there, right? And so the idea is that you can build, as we'll see, you can build reliability on top of these other protocols. And so for the IP layer, we can keep it more simple, and we can allow different types of applications to be, to be built on top. And they can choose. Do they want to have uh, deliverable? <coughs> Do they want, well, integrity is also an interesting thing. So there's also no guarantee that when I send something, you're going to get the exact same thing. I, uh, there's a great blog post a while back about somebody debugging a SSH connection error from one host to the other. They would find that it would crash every once in a while, like the connection would get terminated. And they did a lot of digging, and they found out that one router was flipping one bit on all the packets to always be one. And so the other side would get it, and it would get out of sync, and so it would blow up. Um, so yeah, crazy stuff can happen in the network, but the protocols don't guarantee anything. Um, and the other cool thing, this, so this is the core feature of IP. It guarantees that I have an IP address, I can send a packet out to somebody else's IP address, and it will try to get it there as best they can, right? So for direct communication, when we're talking uh, when you're talking directly to the next hop on your network, uh, there's a lot of protocols that go into here. We're not going to really go into there. Uh, I highly recommend, especially for those of you that want to be security professionals and security people, you have to start reading RFCs. Do it for fun. Do it because it's awesome. So RFC 791 describes exactly what an IP datagram looks like. And this is uh, very cool stuff. There's no magic in here. It's all laid out. So there's first a four. So this is bit 0 to 32. So the first four bits are a version number, uh, followed by a service type, followed by the length of the packet that the IP diagram is going to send, followed by some identifier, some flags, a fragment offset, as we'll see in a second, a time to live field, a protocol field, a checksum, a header checksum, so it does have some type of error correction things in here. The source IP, the destination IP. Right? Important thing in here, you can already kind of design this in your head, right? These have to be 32 bits. Right? We're sending from one IP address to another IP address. And so they each, just like when we're filling out a letter, we have to put our address the source IP address, and the destination IP address. Why is source IP address important? What was that? Like if, if a network uh, fails to recognize the uh, actual, or if there is an error, it has to uh, send it back to the sender. Yeah, so errors just like on the post office. What about if I sent you a letter and I said, well, I'm giving you $100 but I don't put a return address. Are you going to be able to claim your $100? No, oh, because you don't know where to send that letter response back to to say, yes, I want this money. Please transfer it to this address, right? So this means that the node that's getting that IP address pack, that IP packet can reply to it, right? Because it just needs to reply to the source IP address. There's option fields. There's padding, which will make sure that uh, we, we go to 32 bits. And finally, we have the data that we're going to send in the packet. Uh, so some interesting things in here where things kind of start to bleed. So what's the time to live field? It kind of sounds very cool. It sounds like James Bond or like 24. How much time to live do you have? How long to wait for a response for like a, an anthology? How long to wait for an acknowledgement? Not quite. Yeah. Is that the number of hops before it expires? Yeah. So the idea with the time to live is every hop. So you send it to your router. That router sends it somewhere else. That router sends it somewhere else. Every router will decrement that time to live value by one. And when it reaches zero, then they just drop it on the floor. So why is that handy? It gives traffic. What was that? Decrease traffic. Decrease traffic. Session time. Loops. Yes, if the network ever gets in a loop where I'm porting it over here, this person ports it here, ports it back to me, right? We mentioned a network loop. Otherwise, this packet will travel forever and just clog up our network. 
right? So with a time to live value, we know a packet will die at some point. And the other thing with, um, uh, it has other uses, so usually, well, sometimes, depending on the configuration of the router, it will send a message back to the source IP address that says, hey, you know, I dropped your packet. Sorry, like. <laughs> so that way, at least you know. We'll see that actually comes into play. The other interesting thing here is we have a protocol field. And this protocol field actually defines what type this data is, which is kind of this weird blurring of the IP layer and the other layer, other layers on top of it, as we'll see. So normally, it'll be about 20 bytes. So we have version of the set, the header length. So this specifies how long the header is because we have additional optional fields that we can put into the header. A, a TOS, so a type of service, which is the first three bits are priority and quality of service. Um, these are pretty much never used. Right? So they thought, that they, they thought it was a good idea. Um, and, but how can you, you know, who's going to say whose traffic is more uh, important than other people's traffic. I've heard that like the military network uses these flags for different types of confidentiality, and, uh, but I don't know that that's 100% true, so don't quote me on it. Do look it up for Jack. The total length, so we have the total length of a diagram packet, and an ID, uh, which is a unique identifier for the diagram. So we'll look at this in a second. So the important thing here, total length, means we can send a letter that has at most 65,535 65, bytes. Right? It's a pretty long letter right? in one IP packet. So we have flags, different flags, um, and an offset, which we'll talk about in a second, time to live, protocol, checksum, and finally, uh, the addresses. So there's options. Um, you know, so these options can have different security things in here. Uh, it used to be that you could ask every packet or every router on each of the hops to put basically a little timestamp that said when they got it and who they are into the option field. So this way you can see when the packet got there what route it took. Um, they've since basically disabled all of these things because um, if you're running a network, you don't want people running who you're running traffic on to know how your network works. Um, this is an interesting one, the source route. So you used to be able to say, hey, I want to talk to this other IP address, and when I do, send it through these routers. So you can specify the path that it can take. Why would that be a good thing? What was that? Yeah, maybe I know like a really good path through the network to get to that other system, right? What's the bad thing? Yeah, I can I can increase the traffic to one particular router and kill it, right? So I can force a bunch of traffic through this router and it's not designed to handle that, right? And so if this is one of those things where they thought like, oh, this would be a cool like flexible feature of the network, and they end up not doing this anymore because it introduces security problems. Lots of others, read the RFC if you're interested in all these other optional uh, fields. And so, so the IP gets our traffic from one node to the other. And we'll see exactly how this is done. Um, so the IP packet though is encapsulated inside a physical frame. And so that is going to have its own frame header, and the data of that frame will be the IP packet, right? And the IP packet, the data that's inside that IP packet will be another protocol that has its own header and other data, uh, as we'll see. So, how, does the, how do these packets actually get from one node to the other, right? That's kind of the key question we want to think about here. So, the first, so what are the two scenarios? Well, one would be the IP address is in some completely different network. Right? Google.com is not in my local network. Right? I have, so my packet has to hop 
multiple hops, multiple routers get from me to Google.com. <coughs> the other option is maybe the computer I'm trying to talk to is on my local network. Maybe I can talk to them directly. Uh, so that's where direct delivery, delivery comes in. So if we're in the same local network, then I can just deliver it directly. So this is where we get into that cider routing. So the idea is if I'm on this subnet, let's say 11, 10, 20, uh, we have this machine. So we have a machine at 11, 10, 20, 121, and another machine at 11, 10, 20, 14. So how do I know just from three pieces of information, the subnet and the two IP addresses of being on the same network? So Ethernet is a widely used link layer protocol. Um, has all kinds of nice features. The addresses are all 48 bits. Uh, there are different types of requests. So you can send at least uh, 
46 bytes and at most 1500 bytes. And it has a CRC check, which can detect very simple kind of bit flip errors and correct them. So it's actually kind of funny. I mean, each layer doesn't promise you know, reliability and all this stuff, but they have all these features like checksums and CRC values uh, just to try to improve the reliability at each level. So the question is, how does dot 121 know how to talk to dot 14? Yeah. Right? Just like, well, I don't got there yet, but just like on DNS, when we type in google.com into our browser, we know from what we've just seen, my computer needs to send out an IP packet to some Google server. So it needs to know, how do I translate this name to this IP address? Yeah. Right? We talked about it using DNS. Similarly here, we need a mechanism to turn an IP address into a physical address, a link layer address. And so that is where ARP comes in. So ARP is the address resolution protocol. It basically, this is its job. It's a protocol to allow mapping of IP addresses to link layer addresses. And it's kind of weird, right? You think about, it's now, this is what I was saying, there's, there's not this beautiful separation between all the layers, right? Here we have a protocol that translates between IP layer kind of to link layer, but how do we send these messages out? Right? We, do we have to develop another layer below that? And so they kind of use the link layer to find how to do this ARP thing. But it's a link layer. How should it know what IP is, right? But it kind of has to to make these things actually work. So this one, when you really start getting down to the details, you can see that these beautiful abstractions start kind of breaking down. OK. So host A, so our host A wants to know the physical the hardware address associated with the IP address of host B. Remember, the machines only want to talk to each other on IP addresses. Right? So basically, host A says to everyone, broadcasts to everyone on the network, says, hey, who's got IP address B? Wait, no, what's the wrong direction? And then host B will be reading those messages and read that and go, oh, hey, I'm host B. And so it will reply directly to that message to say, I am host B, and I can be found on this uh, MAC address. Uh, and then host A will cache that response so that it uh, doesn't have to keep making these requests. And to optimize things, there's a little bit of an improvement here. When host A sends its request, it includes its own IP address. So this way, people listening on the network can see who's has what physical addresses, right? So essentially host A says, hey, I'm host A on physical address foo, who's host B? And host B will listen for that, cache store who host A was, that it's on physical address foo, and say, hey, I'm host B, I'm on physical address bar. And now they can actually both talk to each other over their local network. So ARP messages have a hardware type, a protocol, a hardware size, a protocol size, and the sender ethernet, sender IP, target ethernet, target IP. Right? So this is another one of these blurring of layers, right? This packet, I mean the format of this frame uses IP addresses even though it's in the link level, right? Which is technically a higher level protocol. Uh, the option field specifies if it's a request or a reply. The sender Ethernet IP and the target Ethernet in a request is empty, and the target IP is the requested IP address. So you can actually do this on your own if you're on a network. So you can run this um, ARP-A command, which will print out basically your ARP cache. So if you Google, there's a way to flush this from your cache so you don't know anybody's MAC addresses. So the idea is we have 192.168.1.100 and 192.168.1.10. They want to talk to each other, right? 
And so host A, you can use the ping command, which we'll get into exactly what that does, but that essentially sends an IP packet uh, from dot 100 to dot 10. And so by looking at this traffic, so this is the TCP dump of the traffic here, uh, we can see that, let's see, so 8046, so this starts with 8. So host A's physical address sends out an ARP, an ARP who has, so who has dot 10 tell dot 100. And so that's the ARP request getting sent across in the local network. Host B will reply, so this is from 0 to 8. So what's all these Fs? What's that? Some of you want to raise your hand. Yeah. Is it blind or empty? Uh, almost, kind of. Mac broadcast Yeah, so it's all ones. So you think about Fs, it's all ones, and that means it's a special address. That means send this to everybody on the network. So everybody is listening for these requests. So if they get an Ethernet uh, frame from something with all Fs or something to all Fs, they will read it. Cool. So then we have one, the MAC address zero, sorry, not one, zero, sending to eight, and replying and saying, hey, 192.168.10.1.10 is at zero. Which now the ARP reply gets sent. <coughs> and then we can see the echo packets in here. So this is an IP echo packet, which is how ping works. We'll get into that in a second. But we can look at the ARP cache. And we can see that now host A has cached that B is at that address. And host A has cached that 100 is at that address. So they actually both get to learn each other's addresses. Cool. Questions on this? This will become important when we talk about how to hijack these things. But for right now, we're going to need to understand the basics. Yeah? Is the host B going to set up MAC address? Maybe. <laughs> Depends on things we're going to talk about next. Yeah? Well, I think I understand what the ARP is. What's the 60 colon? The 60 colon that, let's see, we have to go back here. It is one of these values. I don't know which one. Uh, it doesn't have ports at this level. Because ARP request is requested from ground port. No, no, no. It's that ARP is at the link layer. So this is an Ethernet frame. So there's no transport level things uh, above it. Um, it's probably one of these, op these either this, not the op field, maybe the size. It could be the size here. Or the protocol size. I don't know. That would be a good thing to look at. Yeah. How will the uh, host update their cache uh, if the IP address is changed? Ah, so uh, that's a good question. If the IP address, so if the IP address changes, then you're not talking to the same machine, right? And your connection will drop. So if dot 10 decided to change its IP address to dot 20, if they never tell host A that, then host A will never, can't talk to that machine anymore. But if so, that would be one thing. The other thing would be if host B changes its MAC address. Uh, so host A would probably try talking to it, not get any reply, and then do the whole ARP thing over again. <coughs> the cache will also uh, invalidate after a certain amount of time, too. But that's probably operating system dependent. Yeah. Is that why the like, calls get dropped sometimes if you're like roaming? Like, it would, would you be like changing radio towers? Because that's another calls, Yes, calls also can get dropped when you're roaming because your IP address may change when you get to a new yeah. tower. Um, so it may not necessarily be uh, the MAC address changing, but yeah, you're basically essentially detaching from this network and going onto another network and attaching yourself. So you get a new IP address. Um, yeah? What happens when multiple machines set a static IP address for the same thing? <laughs> what happens when multiple machines get the same IP address? Does anybody face this situation? It's, it, it's a nightmare. It's a, one of the worst problems you've ever had in the network. Uh, I've done this with some research stuff. It'd be insane. Like, 
you try SSHing into your machine, and it would work, and then you exit and try to do it again, and it'd say key fail. And you keep trying it, and sometimes you get it. Uh, so yeah, you basically, whoever wins on the ARC reply, that's who Jose will start talking to. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's horrible. I don't wish that on anyone. Yeah. Well, We'll get that in a second. They're either on a switch or a hub. So you can think about their ethernet's plugged into either switches or hubs. Um, that's kind of all we'll get into right now. But we're going to get into how those work, but essentially you can think that they'll get all those packets, the link layer packets will go to all machines, more or less, yeah. What's the ICMP? Uh, ICMP we'll get to in a second. It's what the ping uses to talk to other hubs. So it's just an IP level for ARP-A is showing host A's ARP cache. Okay. And then why do you call it before you ping? To show that it actually gets, it didn't know it before, which is why it has to do the ARP request. And then after there, it's the entry for B is in host A, and the entry for A is in host B. So the important thing to remember is right now we're talking only on local networks. So for this local network, you need to configure every machine to say, this is your subnet, so this is who you talk to locally, and this, well, and this is your IP address. This is either done dynamically through DHCP, so when you first plug your computer into basically your router or when you connect to the ASU wireless, you send a message that says, hey, I'm new here, this is my physical address, I need an IP address. And then the router will listen to that and give you an IP address and say, great, you use this. Uh, the other way to do that is to statically assign each host an address. So that's part of configuring host A and host B is saying, okay, this is your IP address, this is what subnet you're on. Um, so how does it happen where two can have the same IP address? Uh, we, I think it happened for us when we ran out uh, we had too many hosts on our network, and so the DHCP started reusing IP addresses. Uh, or when we had static IP addresses that were in the range that DHCP would use, and so eventually it would get to those, and everything would be horrible. More questions? necessitate that we are on the same local network, right? Local network is defined as whatever is on your subnet. So for the ciderless routing, uh, the cider routing, whatever is inside your local network is a host on your network and you can talk to. So this is important if you're ever trying to debug weird networking issues or trying to set up complicated networks. You need to understand each host on its subnet, it thinks it can talk to any host on that network. Okay, so we'll imagine the scenario that these are basically, so the key kind of that we've all been talking about is how are all three of these computers able to talk to each other, right? So there's two main ways this happens. One is either through a hub, so does anybody actually use the hub or bought the hub? What's the difference between a switch and a hub? Uh, I don't know how to give examples. Uh, yeah, 
any packet that comes in on any one port, it sends out to all the ports. Right? So it's essentially any packet that A sends would also go to B and C. So that's what a hub is. So there's a very technical difference between hubs and switches. Although I'm pretty sure now um, almost everything is going to be a switch. Yeah. Uh, because uh, one hub is one position domain. Oh, that today? One hub is one position domain on network uh, physical layer. But yes. Switch separates position layers. Exactly. So you'll get a lot of collisions there. Yeah. When would you use a hub and when would you use a switch? Uh, uh, hubs are cheaper. The real answer, or probably were cheaper. I'm sure now they're. Is so there like a technical reason you use one over the other? Not to my knowledge. That's not the failure. Maybe, although I don't know. I've never had any switches very really failed. Yeah. Could you use a hose a cheap network tech as well? Uh, you could use. Well, yes. We'll get into that. Uh, yes, you could use it as a very cheap. So if you wanted to, uh, let's say, listen in on. All of the traffic from A and B and B and C, you can plug into the fourth port here and see all the traffic that's coming across there. Uh, so a switch, the difference is a switch is listening to all this traffic. It's building up its own ARP table internally. So it, except it's not mapping IPs to MAC addresses, it's mapping ports to IP addresses. That's, sorry. Physical ports on the router, sorry. Physical ports on the switch to MAC addresses. So, for instance, when it sees a MAC address, a link layer packet from host A with that MAC address, let's say that's on port one on the switch, it'll say, oh, I know that this MAC address is on port one. And it's going to send a broadcast, so it will send that out to every packet, or every port on that switch. When the reply comes back, the first thing it'll say is, oh, this means on port three, this MAC address is there. And it looks it up in its table. This is a, pa uh, sorry, I keep saying packet, but I believe I mean frame. Uh, this is a frame, an Ethernet frame for 08. I know that's only on port one, so I'm only going to send the packet there. So it keeps the mapping of physical ports to MAC addresses so that once it knows that host A, host A's MAC address is on port one, it won't send Ethernet frames to any other port except for port one. Does that make sense? So then you get rid of some collisions and have a lot of benefits. Okay. This also applies to um, the attacks are up. Uh, talking about also applied to wireless networks with some caveats that we'll try to get into when we can, but it help, it's helpful to think about these kind of just as wired local networks. Yes, does nothing happen. Will the switch, <laughs> will the switch generate some sort of error to send it to because ah, it doesn't know? If it doesn't know what port, it'll send it to all of them. Okay. Right? So it defaults into basically a pub like behavior if it doesn't know. Cool. Okay, so now that. Now, even with the very quick, brief amount of information that we've studied, we can talk about attacks that we can perform against the local network. Uh, so, what do we want to do? So, you're on the local network. Let's say you've plugged in or you've taken over a machine on the network, right? That could be either, either scenario is valid. What do you want to do as an attacker? Gain information. Gain information. What kind of information? Um, addresses, like the architecture. Okay, I may want to uh, do some reconnaissance to look at the uh, architecture, the layout of the network. Well, yeah. See who's based on what you said. See like, who's plugged into that network. What IP addresses they might be at. Who should get their information MAC addresses. The other IP address. The other MAC addresses. What do you want to do? You're a bad person. Yeah, maybe I want to deny traffic. Maybe uh, there's a, an auditing machine that's constantly looking at traffic. Maybe if I kill that, I can launch some other attack at their website uh, or some other system. What else? Let's go someone else who hasn't talked yet. Go back. Yeah. Yeah, I may want 
to uh, intercept their traffic, right? I may want to see what host A is sending to host B, right? What if those are credit card transactions that are getting sent over the local network, right? I'd love, well, a bad guy would love to get that. <laughs> pretend to be another host, right? I may want to have people think that I'm the database server so they talk to me and send me all the data instead of sending it to the real database. Right? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I may want to not only intercept it and steal it, but maybe I want to alter it and change it as it's going across, right? Um, yeah, all kinds of nefarious things that we want to do. Uh, we want to maybe impersonate a host, perform a denial service attack, and access information, right? Um, and so, this is actually one of the things that we can, when we went back to the first day, we talked about security, right? What is security, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability, right? So denial of service, hit availability, uh, being able to sniff traffic that should be secret is confidentiality, and being able to alter data that you shouldn't be able to alter would be integrity, right? And so there's going to be various ways we're going to do this. One of the ways it, we're going to use basically three techniques we're going to look at. Sniffing, spoofing, and hijacking. So in the case of sniffing, we're actually listening to all the packets that are coming across on the network. Um, in spoofing, we're going to pretend to be another host and try to inject traffic into the network. And in hijacking, we're essentially going to try to do a man in the middle type thing where we're going to take over a connection and have all the traffic flow through us. Okay, hubs versus switches, we covered this already. Um, early switches, or, or early hubs, oh. early hubs, all traffic broadcast everywhere. Um, modern switches keep track. Basically, what we, any, Questions on this concept, hub switches? Cool, so now this does become important when we try to think about how, what can we, what data and what information is being sent to us on our port that we care about. So, one of the things we can do on the local network is just listen and see what's happening. So this is network sniffing. And this technique and part of the reason why we cover this is because this is really important when we talk about exploiting applications over the network or when we talk about web applications. Actually looking at the traffic and seeing what's really going on is an incredibly effective technique. Um, and so a lot of the attacks, attacks we're going to look at start with sniffing. Right? So sniffing, in essence, is being able to look at and see the traffic that's getting sent to one machine. Um, and it's actually trivial. This may shock some of you if you're not familiar with how insecure everything is. Um, this is trivial to do. You can do it. I can do it on my laptop. You can do it on your computers. It's trivial. You set your network interface to promiscuous mode. So what this means is that your OS, your computer is telling the network interface, listen to all traffic, not just those with my MAC address or with the broadcast MAC address. So it will look at all traffic. So once we do that, if we're on a hub, it's game over, right? On a hub, we're seeing all traffic that's getting sent. So all we need to do is just look at what's being sent to our port. What's the problem on a switch, though? Yeah, we're not going to get that traffic. The switch is smart. It knows that only our MAC address is only seeing MAC address traffic on our port. So why would it send us traffic, right? So how can we get around that? Are we just screwed? We don't. We have to make it think we're on the same port as the as one of the users. Ooh, we can make it think that we're on the same port as one of the other users. What else? Start messing with its cache. We can maybe mess with its cache to make it think that that host is on our port. So, when thinking about a physical switch, it would be hard to change our port to somebody else's, right? Without like physically changing it around. But that would be a very interesting one. And you get about a window of when it's in the cache that you would like get all of their traffic. Yeah. Could you change your MAC address? We could maybe change our MAC address. Okay, we'll see. Look at that. Yeah. So the key problem, right, is when we're using a switch, 
We need to essentially trick or convince the switch that, hey, um, that we need to send a copy of that traffic to us. So those are the high level goals. We'll look at the kind of uh, how we do that. But talking about why do we want to sniff, a lot of high level protocols that we actually still use nowadays, FTP, which is the file transfer protocol. Anybody use FTP, upload files? Yeah, a lot of us native web servers. Uh, if you're using FTP and not SFTP, all of your credentials, your logging credentials, are sent in the clear. True story. <laughs> pop, what's pop? Uh, email access, I can't remember what the protocol what it stands for. Post office protocol? Nice. Good. Uh, yeah, your password can get sent in the clear. If you're using HTTP, to send a username and password when you log in, if you don't see that beautiful green lock, your password is getting sent in the clear, and that means anyone who can see your traffic can look at it. IMAP, so IMAP is the another type of pop-like thing of how to access your emails. Also, not included in here, SMTP is also or well, your password. Your password is not sent over your clear text, but your email is sent over clear text. So you should think about email like a postcard, that the mailman can read your postcard, the text of your postcard. It's not a letter that they can't open, they can read it. Okay, so by sniffing traffic, it's possible to collect username and passwords, files, mail, um, and if you're doing pen testing, usually you'll try to, you'll capture some traffic and then transfer it somewhere later to do this analysis. Um, so True story, when Giovanni, my advisor from Santa Barbara, when I was doing my PhD, we did some pen testing of a security, well not a security company, but a, uh, a company in Santa Barbara, and we did a tap and we looked at all the traffic that they were sending, and it turns out, of course, people were using FTP to upload files to a marketing server. So of course we got the passwords to those, and then we just logged in and were able to do uh, some fun stuff over there. So. Uh, it happens, this stuff happens, right? So how do we sniff? So we need tools to collect, analyze, and even maybe replay traffic if we want to mess with the traffic. Um, this is actually one of the <coughs> most used tools in the security professional toolkit, I would say. I mean, obviously it depends on your job, a uh, specific job. Um, TCP dump is a great tool. I highly encourage you to just play with it to see what's getting sent. TCP flow takes TCP up output, and because, well, as we'll see, we haven't gotten to the TCP layer yet. Uh, the TCP is just what the packets getting sent back and forth, and they maybe intermix with other packets in there. TCP flow takes all those and says, this is the communication for most A to most B, and this is everything that got sent. TCP, TCP replay allows you to replay traffic. Uh, this is actually fun in all types of scenarios. Well, capture the flag scenarios or something, you can take traffic that you sniff and replay it against another host. Uh, the graphical tools for this is Wireshark, which is a very cool, very well-known tool. Um, it can be a little clunky, depending on what you're doing. What I usually do is I will usually use TCP dump to actually capture the traffic, because I know it's very good and it will work. Uh, and I will write out the traffic to a file, so use the option to write to a file, and then I'll pull that down and look at it in Wireshark uh, to actually look at the traffic. Uh, so yeah, Wireshark has really cool stuff. Uh, we'll get into the TCP risk and like stuff. And Wireshark also provides parsers for a lot of protocols. So it will be able to take a bunch of TCP packets and say, oh, this looks like HTTP. And so we'll give you one HTTP request. Um, highly encourage you to check out, download these tools, play with them locally, um, see what you can see. So is that an ethical thing that I just told you to play with these things?
to collect traffic that attackers are sending against you. Right? Hey, yeah, so that could be a good way of looking at it, right? You want to make sure you're not under attack and nobody's uh, messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> So when you run one of these commands, right, all it's going to do is turn your network interface into promiscuous mode to get all the, the packets that are getting sent. But is it messing with the switch at all? It's not going to mess with the switch. What is it really doing? It's just listening to what's being sent, right? So yeah, that's, um, it is one of these very fine distinctions, but in my mind, you're not doing anything active. It'd be like if one of you was running around shouting your ASU password and username, <laughs> right? Like, I can listen and hear it and write it down. Uh, you know, maybe I should tell you to stop doing that, but. <laughs> but if I went in and logged into your ASU account with that information, that would be illegal and unethical, right? But the fact that you're going around shouting out your passwords. You know, I have ears, I can listen. It's kind of my view on things. It's like, and it's interesting to see what, what kind of stuff you can do. Cool. Uh, so TCP note, that's the output of the tool that we saw earlier with the ARC packets. So that's TCP command line output. Um, it actually is really cool. So it's not, it's based on libpcap which is a library that allows you to write your own sniffers. So you can use uh, libpcap to write your own sniffers to do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and you can specify an expression that will tell it exactly what package you're interested in. So this could be something interesting when you are actually looking for an attack. You can say, hey, give me all whatever, sin packets or sin act packets or packets with weird flags set. Um, or packets just to this host if you're only interested in one thing. Also, uh, highly recommend if you're doing any kind of networking setup, network administration, knowing TCP up and using it can be super helpful. Um, so last year when I was doing this class, or no, maybe that was a different class. Anyway, I was setting up a web exploitation server, and I thought I got it all set up in our network, and I go to access it, it's working great, and then I try some exploit, and then it just doesn't work. Like, I wouldn't get any response back from the machine. So then I had to use TCP dump to make sure my machine was sending it out. And then I had to use TCP dump at our server. I was not getting any traffic. So I moved to our router, not getting any traffic. And then I finally feel, realized that ASU was, had a web application firewall that was blocking all traffic that looked like a web attack. So I slightly changed what I was doing. It went through anyways. Uh, <laughs> and then I changed it to HTTPS and everything went away. Anyways, highly useful tool. Uh, the interesting thing <coughs> is that you need to be root in order to set, so root is administrator. Uh, you need to be administrator in order to set your interface to promiscuous mode. So there actually is uh, stories at the DEF CON capture the flag where people would find zero day vulnerabilities in Wireshark and they would send out traffic on the network that would exploit those vulnerabilities to crash people's Wireshark. So you would try to look at the network to see who's attacking you. You'd load in Wireshark and the whole thing would just crash. Uh, maybe do it even worse, but I don't think anybody actually did that. So uh, This is another thing to be cognizant of. You know, you have a program that's just listening to random things on the network. That's why I usually like running my listening with TCP dump. Because it's just going to write out what it gets to a file. And then I'll analyze it later in Wireshark, which is not running as a root. <laughs> Lots of options on TCP now. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, the important ones that I use are dash n. So without dash n, it will try to, every IP address that it sees, it will try to translate that to a DNS name, which means like things take forever because they do a bunch of DNS requests. Uh, so yeah, I disable that all the time. Uh, I tells it which one to read from, uh, which network interface. The S packet, I think in newer versions, you don't have to worry about that because it'll automatically capture all traffic. Um, but it used to be when space was a concern, it would only capture the headers of the packets. 
So you would do this on like a competition or something, and then realize you didn't get the data that you thought you got, and so everything, uh, nothing is fun. Um, anyway, so yeah, you can specify hosts, speci specify different subnets to listen to traffic, different ports, uh, direction, so you can specify source or destination. Um, you can specify a protocol, so you can say I'm only interested in packets that have a source even at address of this, IPs, ARP traffic, reverse ARP, you know, all kinds of fun stuff you do. Um, and you can make really complex uh, things here. Yeah, see, all kinds of stuff. All right. So yeah, some TCP dumps, you can TCP dump on interface ETH0. Uh, the dash n will not translate, the dash x will output it all in hex. Um, you can specify size, writing out, reading in a file. So what's the difference here between these prompts? Yeah, one is with a hash and one is with a dollar sign. So this is kind of a convention stating that the ones with a dollar sign need to be run as root, right, in order to work. And this makes sense because we're listening to a raw, ethernet, uh, a raw network interface. We need to be able to be root to set it to promiscuous mode. Uh, here we're reading from a file, and so we don't need to be root. So that's why it looks different. Cool. Uh, libpcap, very cool library uh, that you can write snippers in C, custom snippers to do whatever you want to do. The problem is, even with these fancy awesome tools, on a switched environment like we were talking about. We only see traffic that's dedicated to us and broadcast traffic, right? which is kind of lame. Right? We can't directly sniff. And so, what can we do? Well, huh? What was that? Sniff on the gateway. Sniff what? Sniff on the gateway. What do you mean on the gateway? Uh, so, even well, if you're on a switch, if everybody, if in order to get out to the internet, your sniffer on the gateway to sniff everybody's traffic. Okay, so let's assume that we are a machine on the network, right? We can't change where we're plugged into the switch, right? We're physically, either we've plugged ourselves directly in or we've taken over a machine on the network, right? Either one is kind of the same situation, right? So we can use different techniques. So essentially the switch uses a table with MAC address port mappings uh, in some cases, because switches are physical devices, right? They have limited amounts of memory for this cat. What they'll do, if you just throw a bunch and say, oh, I'm whatever, I'm MAC address zero and one and two and three and four and five, after a while it runs out of memory and so it just fails open into a hub. It says, oh man, there's way too much MAC addresses here to know which where to send, so I'm just gonna send all ports everywhere. Right? And so this way you've essentially forced the switch into hub mode by overloading it. This is where you get into active attacks. This definitely would be unethical on something you don't know. But these kind of things are fun if you can get the permission of people you live with to play with on your own switches. These are kind of fun things to do. We can duplicate the MAC address like we talked about, somebody said, right? We can clone somebody else's MAC address and then we'll get all those packets, right? Um, it may send it to both, the switch may send it to both, the switch may just send it to us, but either way we're getting the packets, we're getting that data that we want, we can use our sniffer in order to sniff that traffic. Um, now, this is the cool one, is when we aren't spooked with forwarding, because part, what's part of the problem here if we just duplicate their MAC address? Their MAC address? Still a race condition when you can respond or it responds in whatever way needs that. Exactly. Or if we're just trying to silently eavesdrop on a connection, right? Well, yes, we may get one packet, but if the other machine doesn't respond, we're not going to get any future packets, right? So although this can be good maybe to try to get some things, uh, ultimately something's going to notice because things aren't working correctly, right? So we can take this up to another level and do what's called ARP spoofing attack. So the goal is we want to sniff all traffic in between two hosts in a switched environment. Um, and the idea is we're leveraging, we're taking advantage of the fact that ARP doesn't have any 
notion of, oh, here's this request, oh, here's this response to that request. Um, replies without a request are accepted by the host that requests them. So, basically, the attacker is going to poison the cache of both victim machines to make each of them think that its MAC address is the correct MAC address. Then, when they want to talk to each other, it'll all get sent through the attacker's system. And our host, the attacker's host, essentially acts as a router and routes the packets between the two. So the idea, so we have our switch, we have host A, we have host B. I think these are the same host, yes. We should give a better name. We're host C now. Now we're on this switch, and we're bad. That's what the block has. <laughs> right. So we know we're, one, we're 137. So the idea is that host A and its ARC table has 1.10 is at MAC address 00, which is over here. And host address .100 is at MAC address 08. So this is the way the ARC tables look like normally, right? Before the attacker's done anything, the attacker says 100 is at 08 and 10 is at 01. So the idea is that host C, the attacker sends an ARC reply to host A that says, hey, dot 10 is at this bad MAC address. And so it updates this table. And host B says, oh, by the way, host dot 100 is at this MAC address. And so it updates its table. Now whenever host A wants to send a packet to host B, it's first going to go, it's going to set the host, uh, the destination MAC address to be the host C's MAC address. So the packet will first go from A to C. C will get it. So it, the ethernet of that port will be sent to this. The switch says, oh, I know who that's on. That's on port two. That's this one. It gets sent here. And then when we send it out, all we do is change that ethernet address to be B's actual ethernet address, and we'll see that it gets sent that packet there. And the same way with the replies. So part of the, yeah? You're not supposed to be on someone's network. Won't they notice that you're connected, and like someone will like not authorized to be on the network, just trying to like connect to the system? Um, so like open Wi-Fi networks, right? Does anybody authorize you to be on them? Uh, also, even just Ethernet, right? If you find the, a plug in the wall in any building here, you can just plug in and you're on the Ethernet. Same with any building. Uh, the other way to think about it, what if host C is an employee's machine, right? And you trick them to download and install some malware. Now, essentially, that machine is now acting as the attacker and has full capabilities of that machine. So even though the user's not physically present on the network, they're still there and able to control things. Is some way to mitigate this at the switch level? Like have a, a smart switch to run software and say, well, I'm seeing two replies that were not, didn't get a request, and try to filter it that way? Could you mitigate this at the switch level? Possibly, but you would have to then have the switch remember every ARP request and make sure that it got corresponding replies, otherwise you drop it. I think in that sense, it would probably, it's probably one of those usability security trade-offs where nobody's willing to take the performance hit on that. And then you might open it up to, what if I just make a bunch of fake requests that I never reply to that eventually exhaust it and turn it into a hub anyways? Yeah? Could it just be mitigated kind of like, um, think about the minimum and minimum attack where you have like keys sent between two machines and they're sending data. So you would send like keys between two hosts that were being encrypted somehow over the network and then once you receive that, those keys and you decrypt the function or a key that you have. They yes. Know and that would require completely changing the link layer the protocol link and all the switches and everything else right. in between, right? But that, that would be without it. Yes, if you could go back and completely yeah. change everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. So there is such thing as like stateful ARC cache, right? So why isn't it used more widely than it does? Um, the stateful ARC caches, yeah, it kind of depends on the system, right? And that's part of the thing, right? Is what if one of the packets, what if the request got dropped or something, right? I mean, you may want to know that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. You could always just wait 
until somebody, their cache gets flushed, and then they say, hey, who's this, uh, who is this, who's got this address, and then you just go there before the other person, right? Um, and then you can poison it that way. So, yeah, cool, all right, we'll stop here, and we'll continue on Wednesday.